Good morning, Faithway family. It is good to connect again this morning for a time of worship in song and in words. I want to congratulate Brendan and Yannicka on their uh, wedding. I trust that your marriage will be blessed by the Lord in all of your days together. I want us to start just this morning with a, a brief word of prayer before we come to God in, in worship. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your hand uh, afresh upon us, Lord. And, and Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you are the God who created all things. And you're the God who is at work in us and through us. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would lead this morning. I pray that you would take hold this morning of all who will gather together this morning and, and uh, connect, Lord, uh, with faith way. I pray a rich blessing upon their lives. And I do ask, Lord God, this morning that we would indeed hear from you, that we would sense you, Lord, in our hearts and so still our hearts. Lord, take hold of our hearts and grant us, Lord, to know your goodness and your grace. Lord, bless, Father, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Marcus, Lord, I pray that, that you would have your hand upon this newly wed couple, and, and Lord, that they would know your blessing, they would know your strength, they would know your goodness, they would know, Lord God, the hand of God upon their lives, guiding and directing and taking hold of them and, and steering them, and Lord, just uh, on, on, on revealing to them, Lord, your goodness and your will and your purposes for their lives. And so we join together and say amen to a blessing upon their hearts. Lord, lead us in these days, in these days of change, in these days of transition, lead us. And direct us, Lord, as we anticipate opening in a couple of weeks. Direct us, Lord, in doing so, Lord, safely. In doing so, Lord, in considering one another and in doing so, Lord, under the blessing and the, and the hand of God. And so, Father, we ask that you would just take hold of us. So give wisdom, Lord, to all the churches throughout Ontario, that they would just know your hand upon them and, and protect us, we pray, uh, that, that witness, that light of God would shine so brightly, Lord, through your churches in these days as we, as we transition in change, but Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the God that we serve never changes. And so, Lord, be the focus this day in your name. Amen.
as we come together this morning, I want to remind us again of the title of our series. It's Steadfast Faith. Steadfast Faith. James is speaking to those who are facing trials. And we face trials of many forms and in various ways. But James' focus isn't always on the trial. His focus is on our faith coming out of trials and our faith in the trial. We have covered a lot of ground in the last number of weeks through the book of James. And James's heart, as he moves forward, has a, has a desire for being heavenward. His heart is that, that we would live in light of eternity. I say that that's so often in these days and in, in my messages, but that we would live in light of eternity as we face various trials instead of living in light of this present day. To put it in words of James's uh, brother, that we would deny ourselves, that we would take up our cross, and that we would follow Jesus. That we would be those who walk in wisdom. That we would be those who are doers of the word and not hearers only. That we would be those who have faith that works. That we would be those who do not show partiality to one another. That we would be alive that there be life in us because there is Christ in us, because he is in us, that we be examples of grace because we are recipients of grace in Jesus Christ. Now, I say all of that this morning just as we are coming to this passage because we're coming to a passage that we all stumble in. Yes, we all stumble in it. And that's not me saying that. That's, that's coming straight from this passage. We all will stumble in with our tongue. James here is very practical. He's touching on a nerve, if you can pardon my pun, that we don't like to focus on. And we especially don't like to focus on our own. And that is our tongue. Maybe if James was writing in 2020, if he was writing this epistle to the churches of Canada or the West in 2020, he, he wouldn't just name it Taming the Tongue. He might name it Taming the Tongue and the Thumbs because most of our talking these days happens with our thumbs. And so as you come to this passage this morning, I want to just bring a disclaimer. I want to let you know that I'm speaking to myself first. I'm speaking to myself first. There's everyone who has listened to this message this morning, we all are in it together. And we all need to hear it together as well. And so let us turn to God's word. Let us turn to James this morning, chapter 3. And we are going to read the first 12 verses. James chapter 3, 1 to 12. James says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at a ship also. They, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, set on fire by hell. Staining the whole body, set on fire, the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. 
With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does spring pour forth from the same? Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, and a grape uh, fine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let us just bow in a word of prayer. God, as we come to this passage, how revealing it is to us. Lord, I come and I ask that you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would indeed touch our hearts, open them to your word, and that your word would penetrate into the areas, areas and the crevices that, Lord, it needs to go today. And that we would know the power of God's word upon our lives. We would know the, the, the power of your grace transforming our lives. We would know the power of your Holy Spirit taking hold of our lives this morning through your word. And so, Lord, come. Lord, take hold of my tongue. Take hold of my lips that they may speak forth your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to give you a biblical narrative as we go into this text of the use of words through the Bible as we come to verse 1. In the beginning, God spoke, didn't he? God speaks. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God created all things through the power of words. Isn't that a remarkable thing? To the power of words, he said to Adam and Eve and give them instructions of, of how they were to live their lives, be fruitful and multiply. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says that God upholds the word, the world by the word of his power. He spoke throughout the Old Testament, uh, through the, the, the prophets and the New Testament. He speaks through his son. He speaks words to us. Uh, the testament that he has given us is a testament of words. God continues to speak to us in this way. And we need to realize that as we come to this passage that's really speaking about words and speech, that God has continually used speech, continually used words to minister to us, but he has done it so perfectly. He has done it perfectly. So God speaks. There's a the reality as well that Satan speaks. Again, going back into the, the creation and, and the fall and, and, and Satan coming along and, and he speaks to Eve. He says, did God really say? Did he really say that you should not eat of this tree? He speaks deception. He speaks his cunning in his speech. And so we need to understand as well that now speech can be used not in a perfect way, but in an imperfect way, and that it can be used in many evil ways, as we will see in this passage. And then we come to verse 1, and people speak. People speak, or more importantly, people speak for God. James opens in verse 1 with, with a word of caution for anyone who, who has a desire to become one who teaches the word of God. When we think of God speaking, when we think of Satan speaking, when we think of our own fallen nature, we must accept that this role, I see it in my own life, that this is a, a serious role that has great responsibility and the judgment is attached to, in a sense, every word. One pastor puts it this way, there is no special honor in teaching, only special pain. Only special pain, and that's so true whenever you're in that position. Our words have an impact on others. And when they leave their, their lips, they cannot easily be taken back again. 
the teacher places himself in greater danger of judgment because the main tool for his ministry is the part of his body that his mo- he has most difficulty in controlling as the tongue. That's so true for us all. You may say to yourself, well, that's okay for you. I am not a teacher, so this doesn't apply to me. But in, in some sense, in a small sense, we're all teachers through the Great Commission because we've been commanded to go and teach. We, and that might be in our family. That might be to our children. And it, it, it should be and, and prayerfully be to those that we are trying to reach. So James begins with instruction to those who desire to teach the Word of God in a formal way, but he doesn't continue in this narrow sense. And in some regard, his emphasis on teachers is just building up this this, and heightening this responsibility and danger connected to the tongue, which, which goes through this whole passage. And so in verses 2 to 5a, we see that the tongue is a key component of holy living. The tongue is a key component of holy living. See, at the end of, or the beginning of verse 2, he says that we all stumble in many ways. James is including himself in this. He says, if anyone does not stumble, he is a a perfect man, uh, able also to... uh, bridle his whole body. The word perfect there can also be translated as a mature man or a complete man. And maybe your Bible translation translation has it that way. So the person who does not stumble in what this say is a complete person, a, a holy spirit person when it comes to their speech and when it comes to their conduct. This speaking is speaking in some regard to what we will experience when we are made like him and we are with him in glory. The reality is that there is only one person who has ever lived this out on earth, and that is Jesus. He is the perfect person. James is saying there's nobody like this. We all stumble in what we say. He's speaking more than just what we say. We could limit this to verbal words, but how many times do we speak to ourselves in our minds, in our thoughts? We, 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 we speak of others in our minds. We get angry with others in our minds. He's saying here, our tongue is such a small member, yet it controls us. It controls us. James uses two illustrations here. You will see as you go through this passage that it's illustration, illustration, application. Illustration, illustration, application. And and the illustrations are heightening and, and empowering the application. He uses two here. He talks about the, the, the bit in the horse, horse's mouth that controls it, or the, the rudder that, that controls the vessel. There's a quote from someone, if her tongue were so well under control that it refused to formulate the words of self-pity, the images of lustfulness, the thoughts of anger, resentment, and gossip, then these things are cut down before they have a chance to live. The master switch has deprived them of any power uh, to switch on that side of our lives. The control of the tongue is more than evidence of spiritual maturity. It is the means to spiritual maturity. You see, the, the, the bridle, the bit, and, 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 and the, the rudder have a great place to boast because they control the whole vessel, even though they're so small. And the tongue, even though it is so small, has a great sense of boast because when we allow it, it controls the whole body. It controls us. It creates who we are. And the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, is the Holy Spirit in control of our tongue? 
when we think of a ship as it speaks there, is he the pilot that is directing the rudder and where it should go and what it should say? Or is the tongue in control of us? Came across a, a poem this week that really speaks into this. I think you will like it, and it, it, it is enough in and of its on its own. This is what it says. If all that we say in a single day, with never a word left out, were written each night in clear black and white, it would make strange reading, no doubt. And then just suppose before our eyes close that we had to read the whole thing through. Then wouldn't we shy and wouldn't we try a great deal less talking to do? And I more than half think that many a kink would be smoother in life's tangle tread if half what I say in one single day were, were to be left forever unsaid. This speaks for itself. I think all of us could apply this poem to our lives. The tongue is a key component to holy living, and we will see that even more as we come to the end of this passage. How it controls us, how it speaks to us, how it shows us who we are and who is in control of us. Secondly, verses 5b to 9 is speaking here of the character and the, the potency of the, the tongue to corruption. 5, 5b speaks of it as a, a fire. Such imagery. We all know the power of a fire. It, it feeds on itself as, as does the tongue. Gossip creates gossip. One spark can start a path of destruction. Here in this section, we see a description of the tongue. A description of the tongue. First of all, we see the character of the tongue. He says, a great fire is set ablaze by such a small, a great forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. A tongue is a fire, a world of righteous, uh, unrighteousness. The character of a tongue, it is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It is a system of iniquity. It breeds and fence every sort of sinful passion and desire. One commentator says that no other body part has such far-reaching potential for disaster and destruction as does the tongue. We need to get that imagery into our minds. Well, pause and get into our minds the, the thought of a forest fire. We've seen it, haven't we, last year, the effects that that had on Australia. Well, James here saying this is the tongue, the untamed tongue, our words. They have far-reaching effects. That is the character of an untamed tongue. It burns. It devours. It grows. It spreads. It pulls down. It takes life. Again, I came across this week the uh, the little game of who am I and, and then a description comes and, and so just listen to this and, and think of what am I speaking of? What am I speaking of? It says, I am more deadly than the, the screaming shell from a tank. I kill without, I win without killing. I tear down homes, break hearts, wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity, uh, uh, no purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard for truth, no respect for justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sand of the sea and are as innocent as. I never forget and seldom forgive. Who am I? What am I speaking of there? Well, it ends with saying, my name is gossip. 
Or we could say, my name is any product of unrighteousness from the tongue. And so we see the character of the tongue. Then we see the influence of the tongue. Look at, at the end of verse 6, the influence of the tongue. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. Staining the whole body. The tongue has influence over every part of our body. One person said that it is the prime mover in every act of unrighteousness. Every sort of evil in the world has an ally in our uncontrolled tongue. We talk to ourselves. We talk ourselves into sin. We argue that it's allowed, that it's timely. We justify our actions and our words. And it all comes from the power and the influence of our tongue. That stains that stains our members. It's for the words, the words in our, in our mind, the silent words, and the words on our lips, this influence of the tongue, it stains. Just think of, of uh, hope no one has experienced it, but if you had a, a fire in a part of your home and that, that smell of smoke, it just stains everything. It penetrates it. It leaves its mark. And that is the influence here of an untamed tongue. Mark 7 says, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, idolatry, covet, covetousness, wickedness, uh, deceit, uh, sexuality, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Where do they come out of? They come out of the tongue. There's a tongue that leads us in these ways. So we see the influence, the influence of the tongue. And then we see the continuance of the tongue. It says, set on fire the entire course of life. Entire course of life. Calvin in his commentary, says this, other vices are corrected by age or by process of time. They drop off from our lives. Sometimes the inabilities of old age make us unable to commit the sins we enjoyed in our youth. Vices are corrected by age or by process of time. He says the vice of the tongue spreads and prevails over every part of life. It is active and intoxicating for evil in old age as ever it was in the days of our youth. It sets on fire the whole course of life. See the destruction of the tongue. See the description that James is giving us here. It is a fire setting on course the whole, setting on fire the entire course of life. That's the power of our tongue. It's the power of our words. And then we see the affiliation of the tongue at the end. It is set on fire by hell. Set on fire by hell. I think of the words of Jesus to Peter whenever Jesus was explaining the road that he needed to travel uh, to the cross and the purposes. And, and then G Peter steps in and, and then Jesus responds. What does he respond with? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Set in fire by hell indicates that the tongue can be Satan's tool to fulfill hellish purposes, to pollute, to corrupt, to destroy. And the reality is as unfortunately that the tongue can be used in that way in the church. It can be used to divide. It can be used to destroy. It can be used to stop Jesus' purposes and his will in our lives. It is so sobering to think of the tongue in this way. 
to think of the influence not only over our own lives, but over others that our tongue can have. It's character, it's influence, it's continuance, it's affiliation. This is a, a definition of the untamed tongue. But James goes on in verse 7 and 10, it's our inability in ourselves to tame the tongue. In a sense, we're going down a slope of hopelessness. This passage is full of illustrations, as I've said, and applications. Every beast, bird, reptile, sea creature can be tamed by mankind. That's so true as we, we watch in different shows. People have bears for pets or a lion or snakes or whatever it may be. All these dangerous and wild animals can be tamed. Think of Sea World and the, the killer whale can be tamed and, and, and can be trained to perform all these things. But this is the kicker that, that James wants to get here. He says in verse, uh, verse 8 at the start, but no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. It is always liable to break out. It's restless. It's full of deadly poison. Do you see the power of this illustration? All these wild animals that we would not want to be in the same room as is nothing compared to the tongue. Let's say if I had a rattlesnake as a pet and I said it was tamed and it wasn't going to bite and I decided one day that I was going to go visiting a number of people from the church and I was going to bring my rattlesnake with me and it was going to be around my neck. You would think that I am crazy and you would not open your door to me. Because you know that a rattlesnake is a restless animal, full of deadly poison. And yet here, James is using that type of illustration to make his point that the most dangerous, the most venomous uh, uh, thing in all of the planet can be our tongue. We can use it to bless in God in one Mouthful, one breath, and then the next breath we use it to curse man. And our world is a testimony of that in these days. It is a testimony of that. This passage has been very enlightening so far. In some measure, it leaves us feeling condemned, doesn't it? It leaves us feeling hopeless. What hope do we have if our tongue cannot be tamed by any human being? We're all in this together, aren't we? We all know the destruction and the power of other people's tongues against us in the past or maybe in the present, but we also know the, the destruction and the poison that can, can come out, out of our own tongues as well. The reality of this passage is that it is touching it is touching a part of our lives that we don't like people pressing on. What hope do we have in this passage? Well, I find hope at the end of verse 10. He says, From the same mouth came blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. The words ought not are a strong negative. And the, and the, the reality is in my brothers, he's speaking here to those who are believers. He's writing to believers. These things ought not to be so. No human being can tame the tongue. That's a reality in our lives. But God can tame the tongue. Those who have the Holy Spirit in their lives, the Holy Spirit can take hold of this tongue. The Holy Spirit can take captive every member of our bodies. And James here is saying, listen, don't try to tame the tongue. It's an untamable thing. Don't try to do it in your own strength. Give it over to God. Ask God to take hold of your speech. Ask God to take hold of your tongue. Ask God to take that poison out and replace it with praise. What James is saying here is that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
And when we accept him into our life, there's a transforming thing happens. The Holy Spirit abides in us, dwells in us. And it's through that power of the Holy Spirit that then our speech can become captive to his will and we have now been released into a redeemed holy speech. That's the hope we find in this passage. These things ought not to be so. All that he has come uh, down with so far ought not to be so for those who believe in Christ. That's, that's the reality for us today. If I said to you, that we are to walk in the Spirit and we would not gratify the desires of the flesh, you would say, yes, that is true. But James has been saying that throughout this book only in different ways. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Don't, be, don't have partiality. He says, don't have worthless religion. He says, have faith that works or hope is in what God does in us. But we need to acknowledge also that the problem is goes way deeper than just the tongue. It goes way deeper than the tongue, and that's going into our final point in verses 11 and 12, the inconsistency that goes deeper than our tongue. We want to grab hold of this hope. We want the power of God to be upon our lives, but we need to trace back to where our hope, this hope needs to be applied. In wrapping this up, James is saying to us in verses 11 and 12 that the tongue is just an indicator of something that is going on deeper. It is an indicator of something that is going on deeper. Let's read verse 11 and 12. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives and grape vine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. If we were to turn the tap on today and we were to get fresh water out of it, and then tomorrow we were to get muddy water or, or salt water, we would be on the phone straight away and holding people accountable for the inconsistency that we are seeing. We know that grape, a grape vine produces grapes, and a, and a fig tree should produce figs. We expect the fruit to match the tree. We expect the water to match the source. And James is saying that our tongue is the opening of our heart. It is the fruit of our heart. To put it in the words of Jesus, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our mouth is an indicator of our hearts. On the one hand, James is saying here, to control the tongue is to control the whole person. That's what he's saying at the beginning. But on the other hand, he is saying that the tongue is an index of where the heart is or of what the heart is like. You see, our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in God. Our hope is, is in the work of the Holy Spirit. But that work needs to go deeper than our tongue. As, as Joel says, he says in 2.13, rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, you go to the doctor, and I suppose not too many people have been in the last while because we're not allowed to go. But when you go to the doctor for a checkup, they usually say stick out your tongue because in some measure, don't ask me, but in some measure they can, they can see from your tongue the, the health of your physical body. And that's the same when it comes to our spiritual life. It is the use of our tongue in what we say to ourselves, what we say of others, what we, what we say to others. It identifies the health of our heart. It reveals that. Our words matter. The clicks of our thumbs matter. They, they share our, our, and expose our heart. It's a scary thing to realize that our words leave our heart naked. They expose our heart to everyone. The way we reason sin out in our lives. 
the way we can gossip or slander or the unkind words, and the list could go on and on. It exposes this. It exposes what I'm made up of. James is saying here, this ought not to be so, brothers and sisters. It ought not to be so when taking the words of Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. It ought not to be so for you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Our tongue is tamed in Jesus. It is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And as we continually renew, be renewed in the Holy Spirit, we find that sanctifying power in our lives. Some of you may be reasoning this out away from yourself, but this, is, this needs to resonate, and this needs to be applied to all of our hearts. What is your tongue saying about your heart? In all platforms, in all manner of speech, what does your tongue say about your heart? Apply the hope. Apply the reality of what God has done. Apply God's grace, His goodness to your life so that He can take control of your tongue. Well, let me leave you this morning with a verse. A verse that after going through this chapter, and listen, I want to emphasize again as we end, we are all in this together. After going through this passage, I, I want to memorize this verse so that it will keep me, that it will work in me, that I will have it always on the tip of my tongue when I need to bite it, when I need to bite my tongue. It says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear it. Ephesians 2, 29. We live in a world, we live in a world where we need to speak grace to ourselves, but oh, how we need to speak grace to one another. Look around our world and there's nothing but no grace being spoke to one another. We need to be those who stand out and speak grace to one another. In this passage, James goes deep, deep, deep into the character of the tongue, and it's not pretty. It, it leaves a bad taste in our mouths, if you can pardon the, 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 the pun. But he leaves us with hope. He leaves us with hope with these words, because these things ought not to be so, my brothers. It gives us the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we need to say afresh, God, come. God, come and work in our hearts. God, come and take control of our lives. Pour your grace upon us. Lord, without you, Lord, we have an untamed tongue. And so, Father, do that in our lives, Lord, this morning. Lord, may your word speak with power. And may we recognize, yes, we are all in this together. Lord, I want my words to be words of grace to the hearer. And not words that pull down, not words that slander, not words that lead me into sin. And so work in us, Lord, I pray that we would be a people that this is not so of. And that people will see that. And they will turn to the one who transforms us. And they will experience it in their own lives. In Jesus' name, amen.